Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and it's been ages since I've last done one of these, but they're back. We're doing a PCB breakdown, and of course it is of a RTX 3080, because that's the most recent GPUs released. So, um, the card we're taking a look at today is the RTX 3080 Trinity from Zotac. Uh, the pictures of this card are from Tech Power Up's review of this card, so I strongly recommend you actually, you know, check out the link to Tech Power Up's review of the card, because that covers things like, uh, well, performance, and noise, and temperatures, and, you know, things that I don't cover in these videos. So, um, yeah, a huge thanks to Tech Power Up for providing high-res PCB pictures, and with that out of the way, let's get into it. So, Zotac is kind of lucky that I'm doing their card, like, this card first, because as far, like, from what I've seen so far, this is probably one of the, uh, most down-costed RTX 3080 PCBs, uh, there is. Uh, in other words, basically the worst, one of the worst PCBs there is, and the, the good thing about being first when your PCB sucks is that I don't yet have the numbers for the better PCBs, so I don't know how much worse it is. I just noticed, like, there's less phases, the power stages aren't any better than what all the other cards are using, and they also seem to be cutting down on the total number of output filtering capacitors. Um, now, admittedly, Zotac really, really likes using 1200 microfarad caps, which is, uh, like, cool. Um, but the thing is, um, two 560 microfarad caps in parallel are better than one 1200 microfarad cap. At least depending on what you're trying to achieve. But if you're you know, trying to uh, smooth over the switching noise from a GPU core, uh, yeah, you really do, like, it really leans towards two 560s in parallel compared to one 1200, uh, microfarad cap, because with two caps in parallel, uh, you get, like, you get almost the same total capacitance, but you get half the ESR, and also, uh, you should also roughly get half the ESL, and so, basically, it's better. Um, anyway, um, yeah, let, let's, let's get into it. So, uh, the RTX 30 series is uh, kind of uh, um, interesting in that their VR... Well, it's actually... Yeah, like, the 30 series is interesting in that uh, the power delivery is what I would describe as a mess. So, what I mean by that is that, like, so everything I've highlighted so far <laughs> is, a mix, is a mishmash of memory power and two different core voltage rails. So... Yeah, let's get into it. And actually, let's just flip the card over because I still haven't memorized which how the distribution goes, but you can see on the back of the card uh, the splits in the power plane. So basically, we've got three V-Core phases over here. We're going to refer to this as V-Core 2 because it's the smaller of the two V-Core rails. Then above that, we've got uh, five phases. Yep, five phases of V-Core 1. Um, so that would be V-Core 1 Part 1. Um, we're going to call it that. And then we have memory power over here. So that's VMEM. Um, and memory is just a single, well, I, like, is, uh, well, memory is just scattered around the board, but it is one uh, controller for all of them. Whereas the V-Core is like, this is a separate controller. So that's V-Core 2. Then down here we have VMEM again. Um, and then on the other side, we have two phases of V-Core 2 a unused phase of memory power. So this could have had four phase memory power. Instead, it just has three phase memory power. Uh, we could have also had a six phase uh, V-Core 2 power, but we only have five phase. Um, then above that, we have three more phases of V-Core 1. And uh, there's, again, an unused phase over here, which we also see on the other side. There's a, like, in theory, you could have... How much is it? I think you can have like 10, yeah, you can have 10, like the reference PCB supports up to 10 phases of vCore 1, uh, 6 phases of vCore 2, and 4 phases of uh, memory power. So here's our third memory power phase, so that's vMem again. So, um, let's talk about the, a, little, a little bit about the, so on this side of the board we've got our vMem over here, then we've got, what was it, 5 phases vCore, and right, VMEM at the very bottom. So, yeah. So, I'm just going to go VC1, uh, VC2, and VM for memory. Yeah, that actually makes way more sense. I should just do that in the future um, for more videos. Uh, this was memory power, yeah. VM. Uh, then we've got our VC1. 
and down here we have the core 2. So, now the idea behind having the memory VRM scattered basically all around the PCB is that um, it reduces the distance that power has to travel from the actual VRMs to the memory modules. So, uh, let's say you had all of your memory power, like all of your memory power delivery over here. Well, that would mean that like this memory chip, which lives over here, needs to pull current all the way across the PCB, like all the way from over here to here. And the problem with that is, is if you don't have a particular, like depending on how much current the memory chips are pulling and how much copper the power plane has, like how much cross section the power plane has, um, that can translate into a significant amount of voltage drop. So potentially you could have, you know, like the, the nominal voltage for GDDR6X memory chips is 1.35 volts. That's their spec operating voltage. And so if we want to deliver 1.35 volts to this chip over here, depending on, you know, the amount of current the memory is pulling, because I don't have these cards, so I don't know how much, how much current specifically the memory chips pull, um, and uh, and the uh, cross section of the power plane, what you could end up with is like in order to get 1.35 volts over here, you'd have to have 1.4 volts over there, um, which means all of the chips right next to the memory VRM would be getting significantly overvolted, and this chip down here would still would be just you know getting spec. So by scattering the memory VRM all around the board. What you, can, what you end up with is, like, technically speaking, the voltage is still going to be highest right next to the uh, phases of the memory VRM, but the voltage drop across the power plane, like, the, the lowest voltage relative to the highest voltage on the power plane should be much closer together, which means better power, power delivery to, to the memory system, because you're not going to have, like, some memory chips sitting significantly higher voltage than, than some of the other ones. So that's why the memory VRM is just scattered all around the PCB like this. A uh, similar idea behind having vCore coming into the GPU core from, well, both sides, right? You have vCore 2 and vCore 2 on, on either side of the chip. And we already saw this with the, uh, with the 2080 Ti, where you had uh, vCore power delivery on both sides. Uh, Vega kind of does it with its L-shaped VRM. The Radeon 7 had a U-shaped VRM, which was actually sort of like the peak of, of mashing power into the chip from every single possible t direction to try reduce uh, power plane losses. Um, and then the Titan V had a VRM on either side of the chip. So yeah, um, this, this kind of layout is just better for power delivery, and that, that's why NVIDIA is going with it. Um, but it does make the board a little of a mess to look at. Now, um, so that's that's how the uh, VRMs are uh, split up on the board. Uh, in terms of the controllers, we have a bunch of UP9511s uh, for every single one of these major rails. So the UP9511 is a chip originally introduced with the GTX 10 series. It was very common on 1080Ti's, 1080s. 1070s. I think below the 1070 you had like a UP9506, which was like a lower phase count vari variant of the UP9511. But anyway, the UP9511 goes up to eight phases, which is uh, YV Core 1 is, uh, goes all the way up to eight phases. So um, actually we'll just write that down somewhere. Um, let's put it over here. I'm not going to be, yeah, I'm not going to really write anything down here. So V Core 1 is an eight phase. V Core 2 is a five phase. And of course, uh, VMAM is uh, three phases. So vCore 1 is just maxing out its UP9511 all the way to eight phases. The maximum switching su frequency supported by the UP9511 is 600 kilohertz, and the chip is completely analog, which basically means there's no way to get a voltage reading out of the chip. Um, but on the other hand, like any kind of monitoring, like that chip is not digital whatsoever. You can't talk to it. Um, and the way the voltage is actually controlled on NVIDIA cards is they use a PW... Actually, we should not... Should we go into that? Screw it, we're going into it. I don't care about length. Um, so NVIDIA GPUs have a really cool sort of method of doing voltage control so that they can get really, like, low-cost uh, voltage controllers where basically there's a PWM signal that goes from the GPU core to the voltage controller. That's then converted into a analog voltage level and that's fed back into the voltage controller through a pin called ref in. And basically whatever voltage is applied to ref in is the voltage that the chip uh, is basically set to output. So the cool thing about this is, is that it's really, really, like, you can very easily, because that circuit, like, there's external circuitry to the, uh, to, to that, um, 
to the Raffin input, um, it is very easy to mod these cards because you can basically, like, you can do offset voltage mods where you just put a uh, potentiometer in parallel with the stock PWM vid circuitry, and you can also just disconnect the uh, output of the PWM vid input, and then you get full static voltage control, which is really cool. Uh, there's also, like, the chip is completely analog, so you can set load line with a potentiometer, uh, you can set switching frequency with just resistors. Like, you can reprogram this chip to your heart's content with just a soldering iron and a lot of patience. Because they, these boards are, of course, extremely dense. But yeah, it's a, it's a cool thing about these chips is just, like, they're very, very easy to, to work around. But the downside is there is no way to get a voltage reading from them. There is no way to get a current reading or a temperature reading. Like, there's no monitoring functionality built into these for the... Well, the the chip does monitor current. It's just there's no way to get that current reading from the chip into any kind of software because chip isn't digital. So... Um, that's one of the UP9511s. I actually don't know which one controls which rail because I don't have the card in hand. Um, but it doesn't really matter because all three of them are the same. So, you know, on the front we have a UP9511 and then we have two more of them on the back here. And one of them is taking memory, one of them is taking vCore 1, and one of them is taking vCore 2. So that's all of our controllers. In terms of the... Oops, uh, I was on the wrong layer. Okay, there's no scribble on the wrong layer. Uh, anyway... In terms of the uh, actual power stages in each of our VRMs, we've got uh, a bunch of alpha and omega semiconductor parts. So this one, uh, for the memory VRM, we have a bunch of BLN0 labeled chips, which are actually, uh, and man, this thing has a horrible part number, so it's an AOZ, um, which that tells us it's an alpha and omega semiconductor uh, power stage. Actually, I'm not sure if they... No, I think that actually straight up tells us that it's a power stage, because if the AOS parts are all discrete MOSFETs, or like dual NFETs at most. Anyway, AOZ5311NQI, and it took me a really, really long time to hunt down the, the this chip because they don't have a like marking decoder on the Alpha and Omega Semiconductor website. Also, if you're wondering how to identify Alpha, uh, Alpha and Omega Semiconductor chips, they have a very fancy A scribble. So I think it's supposed to look something like this. Um, which is that scribble over there on the chip. So if you have one of their cards in hand, you just need to... Like, you, you can tell because it's a really not clear logo compared to some of the other semi like manufacturers out there. Anyway, so that's the, the power stage used for the memory VRM. I believe also for vCore 2. Um, vCore 1 is on a slightly different part. Um, as you can see, that has a... Like, that looks like there's AL00 on these. Um, which the funny thing about this, the AL00 parts is that they're also, oh wait, I forgot to mention that. Um, so this is a 50 amp DR MOS component. Uh, so driver MOS and, uh, oh, I still didn't add that to my notes. Well, screw it. But basically DR MOS components, they might have a thermal flag. It doesn't really matter that much. They don't do, generally you won't have temperature monitoring on them. Uh, but the thermal flag basically allows them to tell the controller, hey, I'm overheating, you might want to do something about this. And normally the response of the voltage controller to a power stage overheating is to just shut down the VRM. So, because uh, there's really like, the, the VRM can't exactly go and tell the GPU, hey, Mr. GPU, could you slow down, please? Um, that's, you know, like, again, <laughs> like the controllers aren't digital, so they can't tell the GPU to do that. Um, and even with digital controllers, generally speaking, the controller doesn't have that much uh, power. Um, so the GPU will really only power throttle itself based on the power monitoring circuitry, which is separate from the voltage controllers. So, yeah. Anyway, um, 50 amp DR MOS uh, components, so very dumb power stages, basically. And then up top, the AL00 parts, which that actually looks like AL00, but... No, you know what? Oh wait, I'm just I'm just undoing the Okay, well, we're not going to do that. Sc screw it. Just we're, we're going to roll like I want to finish this video. <laughs> I've done too much. Like there have been a couple takes that it's just like I'm not redoing it at this point. Uh okay, and the AL000 um I feel like I said too many zeros. Either way, you can see it on screen. Just read. Um A That's not okay. There we go, AZ5332, uh, 
two, one, no, two, Q, I. Um, and you might be thinking, oh, if they're using a different uh, part in vCore 1, then it's got to have like a higher current rating, right? Maybe because vCore 1 is a more important power rail, maybe... Except it's not, that's another DR50, like that's another 50 amp DR MOS component. Um, which, uh, like, the efficiency curves for them are literally the same. Like, I actually went through and was like, because I originally assumed that it was all BL and zeros everywhere, but then I noticed that this really doesn't look like a B, right? Like, this letter right here doesn't look like a B. So, yeah, I ended up redoing the, like, spent, spent a bunch of time searching for this, because, again, they don't have a part, like, a part label decoder, so you just have to manually go, like, I literally was going through every single DR DRMOS from... Uh, on Alpha's website from 65 amps down to like down to somewhere in the 50 amp range um, before I found this chip, which was super annoying because um, no decoder. So I just had to go into the data sheet, scroll to the very end until I got the part markings. Um, anyway, so this is another 50, D 50 amp DR MOS component and it has exactly the same efficiency curve as the uh, this thing. So yeah, anyway... Um, in terms of how this compares to other GPUs, so most of the other 3080s that I've seen that are either like based on the reference PCB or even slightly customized from the reference PCB also seem to just be using BLN uh, BLN zeros or the AL zero zeros. So basically, this te like the MOS sets here aren't any worse than what you'd find on a lot of the non-Founders Edition card. The Founders Edition actually uses some very nice smart power stages. Uh, which we'll cover when, uh, like, I'm going to be doing the PCB breakdown of the Founders Edition for Gamers Nexus. So you should probably subscribe to them so that you don't miss that video. And that video will probably have less detail because they actually care about having viewers. Um, anyway, um, so, yeah, anyway, so these are 50 amp DR MOS, and th these are common on all of the 3080s that I've seen so far that aren't the Founders Edition. But this has the least of them that, from the cards that I've seen so far. Like, we only have eight of them in the V-Core 1 and then five of them in V-Core 2. And the three of them in the V-Mem is actually pretty normal. I've Most cards seem to have three-phase memory power. I've seen one card so far with four-phase memory power. Um, also, like, notice again how NVIDIA has that fourth uh, optional phase down here. You know, again, just spaced so that uh, it improves power distribution through the memory power plane. Um, anyway, uh, where was I going? Right, let's, let's talk actual efficiency in terms of delivering power to the GPU core. Now, I don't know what the power distribution is between vCore 1 and vCore 2. I don't know if vCore 1 and vCore 2 power significantly different parts of the chip. That is one thing I really wonder about is, like, vCore 2 may be powering, like, the caches and stuff and, like, memory stuff. And then vCore 1 would be actually powering the CUDA cores, or maybe it's just like both of them power the CUDA cores, but like different, like different split of CUDA cores on each. So I'm not sure. I don't have have those kinds of details. Like all I was like the information I was given by Nvidia is just like there's two vCore power rails, which is just like okay, but I, I like th they're separate power planes. So logically they can't both be like they can't be powering the exact same things but i'm not sure what exactly they're powering into like w what's the difference in terms of what they're powering um also i'm not sure how they behave in terms of voltage scaling so uh yeah because i don't have the cards in hand um and i probably won't have a 30 series card in hand until they're like less than 300 pounds on ebay someday <laughs> because it's just like they're not actually well especially a 3080 just not that interesting um and like PCBs are interesting. Actually buying, like actually spending money on the cards just to push around sliders the same as you do on literally any other GPU ever released is just kind of like, but I could push around sliders for like significantly less money. Um, anyway, um, we're right. So for one volt output voltage, and 300 kilohertz switching frequency. I'm assuming the 300 kilohertz switching frequency, um, like it is a Zotac card and it is on UP9511s. So like these things straight up max out at 600 kilohertz. So I'm pretty sure it's running at 300 kilohertz. Also for 300 kilohertz just gives you better like efficiency in the VRM rather than like you do sacrifice some voltage regulation. And actually even on the 1080 Ti reference card, if you crank up the switching frequency, it's significantly, well, 
the thing is, I think I tested, like, on LN2 at least, cranking up the switching frequency made a significant difference in terms of overclocking range um, on the on the reference 1080 Ti. So the thing is, I wouldn't be taking this card on LN2 just because there's better PCBs out there, but yeah, like, at stock it's going to be running 300 kilohertz. Um, just to, you know, improve the efficiency of the VRM. So... Uh, 200 amps output, this VRM is going to be producing about 20 watts of heat, which is actually, you know, a respectable amount of efficiency for 50 amp DRMOS components. Then 240 amps output, it's going to be producing about 228 watts of heat. Uh, 280 amps output, it's going to be producing about uh, 36 watts of heat. And 320 amps output, which is where the data sheet ends, because 50 amp parts don't have rating like don't have efficiency specs that go to 50 amps output that's just how that works um and that's normal actually like 60 amp parts normally have their data sheet end at 50 70 amp parts normally have their data sheet end at 60 because basically like the the thing is this this current rating is basically like if you have one of these chips with on a board um, yeah, you can totally push 50 amps through it, assuming that there's enough space for, and the PCB has enough layers for heat sink, like sinking heat from the chip and that kind of thing. Yeah, you can do 50 amps. But when you put several of them next to each other, uh, each of them producing a significant amount of heat basically means you can't actually push 50 amps through them all at the same time. And so that 50 amp rating for all real world considerations is just kind of like, like, it's a good comparison point. Like, 50 amp parts are better than 60... Like, 60 amp parts are better than 50 amp parts. 50 amp parts are better than 40 amp parts. But you're never actually going to go and build, like, a 10-phase VRM with 50 amp components and then try to run 50 amp, 500 amps through it because it's just going to get insanely hot. Um, so, anyway, that's why the documentation ends at 40 amps. Also, the doc documentation is public. So, if you just search... Like, if you Google, if you Google the part number, you should be able to find it. Um, so, you know, somebody can go try correct me if I'm wrong about my numbers, um, if you want to mess around with that. Anyway, 320 amps, uh, it's going to produce about 50 watts of heat, which is very hot. <laughs> now, admittedly, that 50 watts of heat is split across, you know, uh, what is it? Five phases there, uh, three phases here, uh, 50 divided by 8 is, I don't know, what's the nearest, like 48? I feel like, yeah, 48 would be 6. So that's like 6 watts per power stage. So that would be like, you'd have like uh, 30 watts of heat over here and like 20 watts of heat over there. Um, like 20 watts of heat coming off of three power stages is not great. So yeah, like it's obviously not meant to output that much current. Anyway, um, then for the vCore 2 power rail, we're going to be looking at um, similar, well, five, you know, three phases less. So one volt, 300 kilohertz, we're going to be looking at 100, wait, did I serious? Okay, I switched up all the, w w switched it down all the way to 100 amps for convenience, but 100 amps, 9 watts of heat output, 150 amps, you're going to be looking at about 18 watts of heat output, and 200 amps, you're going to be looking at about 31 watts of heat output. Obviously spread across even fewer power stages, so they're going to get even hotter. Um, well, actually, no, they're going to be... Like, 200 amps across five phases is going to be about as hot as 320 amps across uh, eight. So, anyway, so... But still, like, that's actually... Like, the, the funny thing is, like, vCore 2 is actually very substantial, but, like, by comparison to cards that never had, like, a vCore 2 rail, but... Um, yeah, so, we, we, like, the, the thing is, like, these cards come with a stock power draw of, like, 320 watts, and it's worth noting that they also seem to run consistently under, under a 1 volt, which basically means, like, you're outputting, um, like, any current that go, like, most of the power going through the VR... Like, if the card, like, if the GPU core, um, because there's obviously memory power draw, which I don't know how much the memory pulls, it's probably around, somewhere around, like, 40 watts, uh, maybe 50. Um, now let's say, you know, you have 40 watts going into the memory, so that means 280 watts are going into the GPU core. We're going to assume some, uh, 10% power loss, um, from the VRM, so. Also, it's worth noting that actually shunt resistors uh, lose you power, because, like, that, that's how they work. Anyway, um, yeah, so you have, uh, say, 280 watts minus, say, 28 watts, so we're gonna just do minus, actually, 
Yeah, well, so you'd be outputting like 250 watts at 250 amps, right? So like there is a lot of current uh, going into the GPU core because the voltage is really low. Um, and also I think I overshot the, the uh, like I, I don't think the memory actually pulled, well, yeah, so at stock, these things probably pull around 250 amps average current draw spread across the two V-core rails. Though I'm not sure how the power split, like w how the current is split between them exactly. So anyway, um, yeah. Um, and then, of course, if you started like, and the thing is like the cards just get power, like if you raise the power limit, the card just immediately uses up any power limit increase. So um, yeah, th these things obviously are not... Uh, like, like, they could pull more more power, so... This VRM here is just kind of like... Like, the thing... Actually, you know what? There's an easier way to know that the VRM is inadequate, and that is, uh, in Tech Power Up's review, uh, they actually test the maximum power limit uh, that each car each GPU that they test offers. And uh, with this card, um, if I'm not mistaken, the review says that the max power limit is 336 watts. Um, for comparison, and that's if you, like, change the power slider. Like, if you're overclocking, max out the power slider, it maxes out at 336 watts, which is very little overstock power draw. For comparison, the Founders Edition goes all the way up to 370 watts max power limit, because the Founders Edition has a significantly better VRM. So, you know, that, that already should tell you, basically, like, even Zotac themselves don't trust this VRM to have more than, like, a very minor increase in power consumption above stock settings for a uh, 3080. So, yeah, this this really isn't great. Anyway, for the memory VRM, we are looking at like and so technically speaking, the memory does run at 1.35 volts, but the documentation doesn't include voltage scaling curves, and I didn't feel like doing voltage scaling curves. Uh, like tr like I didn't feel like doing the calculations using voltage scaling curves off of different components. So uh, for the memory power, you're going to be looking at some like 30 amps is probably going to pr produce around three watts of heat. But again, we're using that one volt, 300 kilohertz assumption, which makes this even less accurate. But the thing is, the memory doesn't really produce a lot of heat. Uh, like it doesn't pull enough power to produce a significant amount of heat. And the VR, like the memory power delivery is really far apart. It really doesn't suffer from the heat concentration issue that say like these two phases right here probably do. Right, like those two are gonna run really hot because they're just flanked by phases everywhere, um, or these phases down here. Though I would suspect that V Core Two is probably on the like lower half of the PCB because V Core Two has to deal with less current draw and therefore it runs cooler because the lower half of the GPU is generally hotter because if you have a downdraft, like if you have an open air cooler. Uh, the way those heat sinks just function, you end up with the lower half of the GPU running hotter. So having v -core t having the lo less loaded VRM lower on the card actually makes a lot of sense from a sort of thermal management perspective, because you don't need as much cooling for the VRM doing less, less work. Um, so you put it where the cooling sucks. So, yeah. Anyway, but memory VRM, th th uh, 40 amps, you'll be looking at around uh, 4 watts of heat, and 60 amps, you're going to be looking at about 6 watts of heat. Um, so, yeah, this is this is actually hitting, like, the efficiency sweet spots, which actually, this is kind of the end of the efficiency sweet spot for the V-Core VRM is 200 amps, and then for this one, it's around, like, it's, it's between 100 and 150 amps. Actually, 100 is slightly... Like, 100 is about the sweet spot for V-Core 2. So, yeah, that's the power delivery here. And again, it's just like, I don't know how this compares to other 3080s because I've not done the, the calculations for, like, the better cards that I've seen so far, um, or even the Founders Edition yet. But, uh, like, this just straight up has less phases and the power stages aren't any better than what I've seen on any of the other cards. So we, we can assume that this, like... Honestly, this seems like pretty decent power delivery, except we also don't know how much... Like, if you start taking off the power limits, where does a 3080 max out, right? Um, that That is an interesting consideration. Uh, there's also other minor voltage rails scattered around the board, like we have this over here, which should be the PEX rail for the PCIe interface. 
Um, and then down here, I would assume this is 1.8 volts, which is a supporting voltage for both the... Well, actually, normally there's a separate 1.8 volt regulator for the BIOS chips specifically, but 1.8 volts for the GDDR6X supporting voltage. And then there's... Uh, nor you also normally have 1.8 volts for the BIOS chips, but I don't necessarily think that's being handled by that voltage regulator down there as well. Now, and then over here, I assume we have our 5 volt regulator because power stages need 5 volts in order to function, or at least most power stages need 5 volts in order to function. There, they do, there are actually some 3.3 volt SKUs out there, but most of the time you need a 5 volt rail for them. And this, actually this could be the 5 volt rail and this might be something else, I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, those are like minor voltages that don't really matter that much in terms of overclocking. Like they're, they're the kinds of voltages where it's like, if it's not present, the GPU doesn't work. But if it, it like messing with the voltage for any reason doesn't really do anything for, for overclocking. So you may as well just not bother. Um, anyway, for the power management, we have a bunch of US5650. Uh, uh, what in the hell? I can't write. Uh, 5650P chips from uh, Ubix Semiconductor, or actually UPI Semiconductor, which are which is part of like Ubix Semiconductor. Um, and there's two of these chips on the card. And as far as I can tell, these are like straight up replacements for the NCP4549, uh, um, though there are still cards using the NCP45491. And the 454... Uh, and... Uh, so... That's the other US 5650, but the 45491 or the US 5650s, basically their job is to, I, well, the thing is, I'm not sure, I can't get a data sheet for the 5650s, but the NCP 45491s were doing all of the power monitoring on the GPU, so they were, uh, so, so I'd assume the 5650s combine those functionalities, because... Uh, in the past, the 45491 would do all of the monitoring, and then there was another UPI semiconductor chip that would actually do the current balancing by switching MOSFETs and shuffling phases around. Um, I assume with the US 5650, the reason why we no longer see a, you know, we, we no longer see the NCP45491 is because the US 5650 just does everything on its own. Um, and the reason why we have two of them is because we have so many shunts. So there's a shunt over here. Uh, this is just a, a bridge. This is like a shunt that you actually m take a measurement from, potentially. I'm not sure that that's what it's being used for, but it pro like the thing is, otherwise you would just use a zero ohm resistor instead of a specifically 0.5, like five milli ohm resistor. So there's another shunt. Uh, there's another shunt over here. And okay, that I think is all of the little ones on the back. And then we have this big shunt over there. Um, this is just an input filtering inductor that's not, you know, power to, like, the, the, it's not a voltage regulator. Uh, here's the power stage for what I suspect is the 1.8 volt rail on the other side of the card. Uh, then if we go on to the, back to the front of the card, we've got a shunt here, a shunt there, a shunt there, and another shunt there, and another shunt there. Um, and I think, yeah, that covers all of them. So basically this card has, in total, uh, from what I can see so far, uh, nine shunts, which is just like... NVIDIA Y. <laughs> so the idea behind having all these shunts is that they can shuffle around phases between the various power inputs and ensure, because the thing is, NVIDIA, for some reason, decided that enforcing a per power, like, so AMD can't do this because AMD cards don't come with all of the necessary circuitry. But basically, NVIDIA really tries very hard to make sure that, like, they are not exceeding the 150 watt power limit of this 8-pin or that 8-pin, which is really unnecessary. Like, 8-pin power connectors can handle a hell of a lot more power than 150 watts. But uh, anyway, so basically, if the card is set to pull 320 watts, it will actually do its very best to distribute evenly that 320 watt power draw between its two 8 pins, as well as like the PCIe connector can't supply that much power. So, you know, obviously they, it's not even with the other two 8 pins, but uh, some power like the, the 8 pin, like the PCIe slot is included in the power distribution. Um, and so basically all of the shunts and monitoring circuitry and the US 5650s, like their whole job is to just reroute power stages from one power connector to another power connector, depending on which power connector is, you know, most heavily loaded. Um, so yeah, um, and, and the problem in the past that I've run into with this, like on a 2080 Ti, um, the reason why I never managed to lift the power, like completely disable the power limit on a 2080 Ti, the, the one time I had a chance to mess with that, 
was because I only shorted the primary input shunts and there was a bunch of like little shunts downstream. So if you short out the primary, sh like if you deal with the primary shunts, uh, the card will actually still power limit itself based on the downstream shunts. Um, now, not completely, because they don't monitor all of the power draw, so it, like, it, the, the power limit behaves very weirdly after you do that, but it's still there, like, it's not gone. Um, so, yeah, and without the documentation for the US 5650s, like, uh, disabling the power limit with this many shunt, shunts, like, completely taking off the power limit with this many shunts scattered around the card, it could potentially be very, very, very difficult. Um... Though, interestingly enough, I, I'm not really seeing a lot of, like, current balancing circuitry. Like, here we have what was obviously supposed to be a little MOSFET for, like, shuffling around the, the memory VRM over here, but that's not there. And, and same goes over here. Like, you can see the little MOSFET footprints. Um, and then we have another one here that's not there. So I wonder if Zotac, in the name of cost savings, didn't include a bunch of the, like phase about like the the power input balancing circuitry um because it sure looks like the lot of the the tra like a lot of the mosfets that are meant to do that are just not on this card which is actually a good thing because a lot of the time like i've seen quite a few cards in the past with the mosfets where the mosfets would blow up um though i've not seen that on like a 20 series yet but there are definitely like 10 series and 9 series 900 series cards where the, the little power balancing st circuitry would end up dying, which might just be like, it might have just been acting as a fuse for some bigger short, uh, short circuit downstream, but still it's like when MOSFETs die, they tend to put holes in PCBs. So it's just better if there's less of them, um, in my opinion. Anyway, yeah, so that is the Zotac 3080 Trinity PCB. Um, I don't know, like, the, the thing, like, the VRM here is very substantial by normal GPU standards. I would not consider 30, the 30 series very normal GPUs, though. Um, also, I'm not really, like, I'm not a fan of what Z Zotac has done with the capacitors. Um, also, like, we have all these capacitor pads for directly behind the GDDR6X memory chips, which makes me wonder, like, I wonder if GDDR6X scales with capacitors. GDDR5X already kind of did. Um, where if you just added a bunch of capacitors to GDDR5X, it would just clock higher. Um, and then GDDR6 also did somewhat, at least on like reference 2080 Ti's. If you added a bunch of capacitors to the memory system, it would just... It wasn't a huge difference, but you'd pick up like a noticeable... No, like, like it, for, from a gaming perspective, it doesn't matter. From a I'm running 3D Mark uh, Time Spy or Port Royal and I want the biggest score, uh, it was actually significant where it's like you, you could run a you know, maybe 150 to maybe 100 megahertz more memory clock if you just added enough capacitors to the memory power delivery. So, yeah, but obviously this is supposed to be one of the cheapest 3080s out there, so we can't exactly be surprised that Zotac decided to prioritize uh, cost savings over just sheer performance with their PCB design here. And, you know, for st like the fact that they prevent you from setting the power limit super high, it just kind of indicates to me, like, at, le at least they've considered that, like, you're not going to be able to blow up the card unless you, you know, start soldering mods onto it, in which case, I mean, good luck taking the card to RMA after you've, you know, abused it with a soldering iron. So, yeah. Anyway, um, there, that's it for the... That, that's actually it for this video, is just, like, for stock, this is fine. Out of the 30, like, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this as, like, a, a benchmarking 3080. Honestly, you'd be better off going with the Founder's Edition in that case. Though, I think the Founder's Edition probably has an even more convoluted uh, power, like, input power management system than this does. Like, this has a lot of shunts, but I think the actual current balancing circuitry seems to be missing. The Founder's Edition... <laughs> almost certainly isn't missing the current balancing garbage. So, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's a thing. Anyway, um, thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with Actually Hardcore Overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. And I'm very sorry to say if you're hoping that, you know, I'll, I'll use the Patreon funds to buy a 3080, uh, you're wrong. I don't really, like... Yeah, no, it's just, like, like, the thing is, it's not competitive with a 3090, so I may as well not bother. 
Um, and the 3090 is just too expensive. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so the Patreon helps out with running the channel, but it does not help out with the me getting a 3080, if, if that's what you're wondering. There's also the HOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch, and the same thing applies to that. I will not be buying a 3080 with Teespring funds either. So, yeah, that is it for the video. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.